This is the Monday, May 2nd, 2016 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new interview every Monday morning, as well as Classical Wisdom Wednesdays and History in Five Fridays. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis. And this is the History Authors Show on iHeartRadio. Today, our time machine touches down during the months after the Pearl Harbor attacks, but not in some far-off Pacific Island theater. Or in Europe, we'll dip into the dangerous waters of the Gulf of Mexico, just as Hitler's U-boats bring the Second World War to America's shores. Once there, we'll meet the Downs family. They're just an average American family. Parents Ray and Ina with 8-year-old Sonny and 11-year-old Lucille. But their story is anything but ordinary. Asleep on the steam merchant ship Heredia when two torpedoes slammed into her, the Downs family was soon scattered on the sinking ship, pitched into a fight for their lives against the shark-infested sea itself, without food, water, or any shade from that punishing Caribbean sun. We'll also meet the commanders of the two U-boats, dispatched by Germany's Admiral Donitz, and see how they combine their duty to the Reich with offering mercy to survivors of their attacks. Our steward on this journey is Michael Togus, co-author with Alison O'Leary of the book So Close to Home, a true story of an American family's fight for survival during World War II. Mr. Togus is the New York Times best-selling author and co-author of two dozen books, including The Finest Hour, which served as the basis for the Disney movie that came out in January of 2016. He's also given us Fatal Forecast, Overboard, King Philip's War, and There's a Porcupine in My Outhouse, The Vermont Misadventures of a Mountain Man Wannabe. You can find him at michaeltogus.com or follow him at michaeltogus on Twitter. That last name is spelled T-O-U-G-I-A-S. Okay, now that we've strapped on our life jackets, let's meet Michael Togus and the Downs family so close to home. I'm joined on the line by Michael Togus, author of So Close to Home, a true story of an American family's fight for survival during World War II. Thank you for making time to talk with the History Author Show. Hi, Dean. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed this book very much. People may get tired of hearing me say that, but that's the only reason to do this is if you enjoy the book. Each book is a little bit different, though, and this one certainly was because it's not a story that you expect to hear. We don't hear much about this war right off America's shores. They didn't hear much about it at the time. So this is exciting to sort of plow new ground. Listeners heard me say in the introduction that You've written a bunch of books that are true survival at sea tales like So Close to Home. So for starters, as somebody who has explored this genre before, what was fresh about the story of the Downs, specifically Sunny Downs, and their experience that drew you and your co-author, Alison O'Leary, to tell it? My experience was similar to yours in that I was so surprised to find that there were U-boats that entered the Gulf of Mexico in 1942 and the success they had and then to come across Sunny Downs all these years later who survived a U-boat attack and each member of his family was thrown into the ocean in a different direction when the torpedoes hit I thought what a great survival story where I can also focus on World War II as well this little known aspect of World War II It seems like the war is right on our doorstep. It's incredible that so few people knew about it, even at the time that they managed to keep it pretty quiet. Eventually, the toll gets so large that 
they have to start reporting it and telling people they're noticing ships aren't arriving. But for the Downs family, they really don't know. They're down in South America when the war begins. Things start to change. They have to get out. How do they find themselves in the middle of that war zone? And how do they decide that they're just going to get on the boat? Because they really sort of have a little of this news blackout. Well, they were returning to America. Their home state was Texas, and they were going to come on the United Fruit Ship Heredia, and that was going to bring them to New Orleans. And they were not aware there were U-boats in the Gulf, as no one was at the time they boarded, which was early May. But they were well aware that you know U-boats were off the eastern seaboard and sinking ships. So they knew it could be a possibility, but I think most folks, myself included, even all these years later, I always thought, oh, that's way too far for a U-boat to travel. And that was not the case. There were two U-boats that had slipped into the Gulf about May 1st, 1942. And the Downs family is heading right towards them. These U-boats had been instructed by Admiral Donitz to set themselves up near the mouth of the Mississippi River and see if they couldn't sink enough ships there to stop the flow in and out of the river. And this is exactly the direction the Downs are heading in. And you've researched and interviewed survivors like Sonny Downs. He's still with you here writing this book, which is nice for somebody who's writing history. You're actually able to have a firsthand account. Exactly. What are the small details of being cast out at sea that help you bring the experience home to readers? Because as I'm reading so close to home, I'm wanting to go get a glass of water because I'm <laughs> really experiencing the thirst along with the survivors. I had always been looking for a book that would involve a family because, for example, my book, Fatal Forecast, it involves three surviving fishermen who were hit by a hundred foot rogue wave and what they went through. But they tend to be male. And here we had the mother whose name was Ina. She was 30 years old and her daughter, Lucille, and then Sonny, the eight year old boy, and then her husband, Ina's husband, Ray, 33 years old. So you had this interesting mix of male and female and for a change, an entire family. And I'd really never come across that before in a World War II book where an American family is fighting for survival. Everything I'd read was always about soldiers. And here's a great story that just about anybody could relate to in terms of this family dynamics and what they had to do to survive. That's true. I didn't think of it till you mentioned it, but I'm picturing the book and thinking of your points of view that you bring. But if you're anybody and you pick this up, you identify with one of the characters because it's heart wrenching. When you talk about getting split up, you don't know what's going to happen. But then Sonny's father has an obligation to him. He's trying to keep him safe. Right. The son is thinking of his father. He doesn't want to embarrass him. He doesn't want to cause him any more problems. The captain has his own trouble because he's thinking uh, he didn't go down with the ship, not to give anybody a spoiler alert, but mm. it's just how it sucks you in to being one of those people in it. And when you're on that life raft, it really, that's always a very suspenseful moment. It comes so much out of the blue. So Close to Home is a perfect title because when I first looked at the map, I saw how near to shore was. And those are the exact words that came out of my mouth. They're so close. Who would have thought that they would be right off the coast of Louisiana? Even though, as you said, we know that they did come, the U-boats. There's one right off Point Pleasant Beach, New Jersey, that they discovered. Nobody knew that it was there. And the Germans thought that that one had gone down somewhere else. So this is something that's really an out of the blue attack on them. And yet you also go down into the Submariners and their experience on these steel tubes. So let's move to that. This is Operation Drumbeat, Donuts and Hitler's effort to bring the war to American shores to sever Great Britain's lifeline as well. It was a turkey shoot sinking 1.2 million tons of shipping from January to mid-April 1942, not just these two U-boats with the entire effort. The Germans called this the second happy time, a string of easy victories as they'd had early in the European war. How much did the Downs know about going and how did this affect their decision to take passage on the ship? And I ask this because they signed something there before they leave, don't they? Yes, they did sign a release, you know, should anything happen related to war, the company of the ship would not be liable but again, they did not know there were U-boats in the Gulf, and nobody did. 
even when the first U-boat by Commander Schott sank the first ship, there was always a delay in terms of releasing the information to the media. The delay normally lasted seven days. And they get on this ship, and they probably thought They were home free as they got closer and closer to shore. Where they intersected with one of the U-boats was just 40 miles off the mouth of the Mississippi River. So they probably thought they were home free. They were making plans to deboard the ship the next morning. And at night, as you said, a turkey shoot, you know, if you don't have radar, you'd never know that U-boat was tracking you. The ship was equipped with some armed naval men up on the upper deck. But again, at night, there was nothing they could do. In fact, they all perished in the sinking. It's expected to be such a smooth journey that Sonny, when he's shaken awake in his bunk, he thinks, <laughs> oh, I must have just hit the dock. We must be in New Orleans. And in fact, it's the torpedoes have slammed into it. And he gets up and he, there's water in the boat. So this is all very suspenseful when you read it and you interview these people. I imagine that kind of takes your breath away because you haven't experienced it and yet you need to probe. So how do you do that? For somebody like Sonny, he's open about it, but he needs to give you the information you need. So as a writer, how do you go about that in these stories? How do you ask these people to open up to you? Sonny's like a you know a rare gem that you find because I doubt today there's any, or if there is, there's just a handful of American survivors of a U-boat attack. So to find him with such vivid memories, because again, he was just a child when this happened, was a thrill. So there was no real effort to get him to open up. I think it helped that I had a track record, you know, in the finest hours had just been made into a Disney movie. But I assured him that we're going to strive for accuracy. And I would just put a tape recorder on as we talked and He opened up and he had the little gems. You mentioned one of them when the first torpedo hit. He thought the ship had nudged the dock in New Orleans and figures this is great. We're home. (laughs) And his father wakes him and gets the sister and his wife, Ina, and they go racing out of their cabins and up the stairs to the upper deck. And just as they reach that upper deck, we'll be exposed and you could board a lifeboat the second torpedo hits and the whole ship lurches over. So now the family that had been together holding hands running up those stairs are all thrown in different directions. So yeah, I was on the edge of my seat listening to Sonny and there was never any doubt about the title so close to home because he had mentioned it a couple of times, you know, we were so close to home. We almost had made it. It was just a pleasure interviewing him. You quote Nathan Miller, author of The War at Sea, to begin Chapter 7 of So Close to Home. He said this early period of sub-attacks, quote, was the worst defeat ever suffered by the U.S. Navy because, unlike Pearl Harbor, it was not a surprise attack. That made me think of maybe this is a reason why we have forgotten these stories and certainly why we don't tell them because Mm -hmm. nobody likes to hear about a defeat unless it's something glorious like the Alamo. You don't want to talk about how we're really caught here with our pants down as far as uh, naval protection from attacks from U-boats. So explain a little bit because you did research it so much about the U-boats and from that perspective, explain the German advantage in early 1942. So the big advantage was the U.S. took their eyes off what was coming their way, these U-boats. They had been warned by the British that Operation Drumbeat was beginning and that eight or nine U-boats were headed their way because the British had cracked the Enigma Code. But the U.S. was so fixated at that time on the Pacific because Pearl Harbor had just happened that we were ill-prepared. And I loved when I would read... These U-boat commanders, in the book I focus only on two, Eric Verdeman, who sank the Downs family ship, and Schatz, who arrived a couple days earlier. But in their war diaries, they would say things like, we can't believe the shores of the U.S. shine as if in peacetime. In other words, we weren't dimming our lights so a ship could be silhouetted between the U-boat and shore lights. They would say things like, can't believe the navigational lights at the buoys are operational, assisting us so we know exactly where to go. They were just 
so surprised. So we were ill-prepared, and even our aircraft were not up to snuff in terms of knowing about when and how to drop depth charges so that both these commanders in the Gulf of Mexico, they had a couple of run-ins with aircraft and even patrol boats, but they easily escaped. And they wrote back to Hitler and Donitz saying, send more subs to the Gulf. This is easy. This is easy pickings. We quickly turned that around. The U.S. did. By 1943, we had improved our sub-hunting skills greatly. But, you know, in the case of So Close to Home, it's May of 1942. We were just newbies when it came to fighting the U-boats. We even leave the lighthouses on. And at some points, they're saying, gosh, they're having such an easy time of it, right. especially a nation that's just been attacked by the water. I had a surprise attack in Pearl Harbor. You would have thought there would be more active watching, more people there on the shores. I know later in the war, my dad, who was a young boy in New York City at the time, they had them watching. Everybody was then watching for everything. They kind of went to the other extreme. Exactly. I was surprised to see in New Orleans that the Chamber of Commerce wanted to keep their lights on at night, and they, so they were fighting against the government in terms of the blackouts, even though by uh, that time they knew the U-boat menace was real. You know, there's lessons to be learned and so close to home about preparedness and being lax, but the Downs family paid the price because they're the ones who, who suffered. My guest is Michael Togis, co-author of So Close to Home, a true story of an American family's fight for survival during World War II. You can find him at michaeltogis.com or at Michael Togis on Twitter. That last name is spelled T-O-U-G-I-A-S. Publishers Weekly writes, quote, Togis, a writer who specializes in survival stories, and journalist O'Leary, impressively render the grim early period of U.S. involvement in World War II. Collaborations in anything can be a challenge, as anybody who's right. been married certainly knows. <laughs> this can be, <laughs> you have different visions, you have different thoughts, but you're trying to produce something professionally. So how did the working relationship go here, sort of in three directions? Well, stories like this that are so research intensive, where most of the people involved are no longer living, boy, it sure helps to have two heads instead of one tracking down the research. And Alison O'Leary was perfect for this. She discovered the real gem in terms of expanding this book to make it so unique to see the story from two perspectives. She found the war diary of Eric Verdeman, who was the commander who sank the ship Sonny was on. So when we got this war diary, first of all, it was all in German, so we, we had to get it translated. But all of a sudden, everything became clear, you know, what he was doing in the Gulf, why he went after this particular ship, how his men were suffering from the heat, how long he stayed in the Gulf, and, you know, the decisions he made. And every now and then, a bit of his feelings would creep into the war diary. So that's one example of working with a co-author. You just double your research skills. I've done it before, and I know some authors don't like to work with co-authors, but for example, The Finest Hours, Rescue of the Bounty, both are with two different co-authors, and I've enjoyed the process. Each person brings something a little different to the table, and then because I've done it so many times, I'm able to blend the writing into one, so the reader never knows who's writing what. Allison was fantastic to work with, and that Finding the War Diary was worthy of a celebration because the book morphed into something I wasn't expecting to see it from both perspectives. This is U-506 Commander you're speaking about, Eric Werderman. Does I have that right? Yes, Werderman is the way they pronounce it, Werderman. And it was not something I expected either when I picked up the book to get this perspective of German submariners. And I take it from reading the book that as you're writing so close to home, your opinion of these submariners changes. You didn't find the guys here when you open up the tin can that you expected, did you? It, that is so true. You know, and in the book, you'll you'll see the, the empathy that myself and Alice and the co-author have when we read his war diary and realize this commander is just 28 years old. Um, it's just the responsibility 
on his shoulders with 52 men to go all the way across the Atlantic into the Gulf of Mexico, right in the heart of enemy territory, and pull off this raid in the way that, you know, they sacrificed for their country. They weren't Nazis. You know, Nazi was a nickname we came up with for Nationalist Socialist Party, and it was the only party in Germany. So you were either part of the party or you were not. And most people uh, who served in uh, the German military weren't even members of the party, but they loved their country and they would fight for their country. As the book unfolded, and I saw it from both Sonny's perspective of, you know, his family is cast adrift in the Gulf of Mexico, but I could also understand what Eric Verdeman was going through. For example, the heat on the U-boat, because they have to say submerged for so long and the Gulf of Mexico is so warm, you know, the heat inside would get up to 110, and yet they were so dedicated to their cause, they used a spare head to store extra fuel and used drinking water containers for extra fuel that they could have had for themselves, but elected not to. You know, that's how determined they were for this Operation Drumbeat mission. And there's amazing moments in there that you just can't believe when you're reading the book. The mercy, I don't know what you even call it, the almost chivalry of war, these stories that we mm. doubt when we hear them in medieval times and even more so when you hear about World War II because we look at the Germans not as the allies of ours in NATO that they've been now since the end of the war. We don't expect them to be treating their victims with honor here. I mean, he pops up and he's he's giving them cigarettes and he just does these incredible things. That, that must have surprised you when you read that. You must have wondered if it was a mistranslation. It, it really shocked me. And I, you know, I was under the assumption that, oh, okay, well, if they're survivors, maybe they're going to strafe them. You know, the U-boat has a guns mounted on the uh, top of the conning tower on the deck. And uh, they did the opposite. If they were survivors, particularly Commander Schatz and the, the second U-boat to go into the Gulf, he would go over to the survivors who were in a life raft and give them water. One time he gave them cigarettes, water, and a cake with <laughs> words written in French that he had taken from Lorient. That's where the U-boat base was. And he'd say, you know, I'm sorry, but this is war. He'd say things like that, or he'd say, sorry, but you have Roosevelt to blame for this. He could speak English, and it just <laughs> it just blew me away. I could picture myself in a life raft, a U-boat approaching, thinking I'm going to be killed any minute. And out come these guys with cake and water and cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> that leads perfectly into the next question, because escaping the sinking ship is one thing. That's just the start of the ordeal. But the survivors are threatened by sharks, hypothermia, drowning, of course, oil slicks, dehydration, not to mention each other. People tend to get pretty feisty when they're shoved in a raft with limited water and literally fighting for their lives. But one fear they have that's unfounded is the one you just mentioned, being gunned down by the U-boat crew. Compare the Kriegsmarines' ethic on that to their Japanese Axis allies in the Pacific. Uh, the Japanese were a different breed in World War II where they would kill survivors, and they did it several times, whereas the Germans, of all the U-boat raids and sinking hundreds and hundreds, it only happened once, and that person was reprimanded. But in this case, with the Downs family, after the ship sinks, the father finds the son, and they're on the same life raft with the boat's captain and one other person, and they're paddling as fast as they can to get away from the sub, thinking they're going to be strafed. And that wasn't why the sub was sticking around. The sub stuck around, the U-boat stuck around to make sure the ship was going to go down. They wouldn't have wasted another torpedo on it, but they would have opened up with their deck guns right at the waterline to make sure it sank. I've talked to a few U-boat experts, and they said it's unusual for U-506 and Commander Eric Verdeman to stay near the ship with their searchlight on. But that's what they did because all the survivors, approximately half the people on the ship survived. So of the 63 passengers and crew in total, about half survived. All the survivors said the U-boat kept its light on. So 
Berdeman was watching to make sure that the ship was going to go down, and you know he didn't want to waste another torpedo. That's another thing that you can't help but admire the sense of duty. He's making sure the ship goes down before he enters it in his logbook and says, I sank it. It would have been easy enough to say, I'm going to save my own skin and get underwater and just, uh, we'll count it, you know, uh, no big deal. But I assume it'll go down, right? Yeah. yeah, there is this code of honor keeping track of the ships they sank. And there's a little friendly competition, too, between Ferdinand and U-506 and shot U-507. Yeah, if he didn't knock it down or he didn't, he didn't want to use an extra torpedo on it either, as you said, they're constantly conscious of all those things. And so that adds a whole new level of suspense to it. You find yourself wanting to sort of go outside and breathe some fresh air. Were you ever in a submarine? Have you ever tried that as part of your research? I know that there's a you boat hmm. you can go and experience. The one I'm aware of is the one in Chicago, which is the exact same model as the ones in So Close to Home. The one in Chicago is U-505, and I was in that, and I could understand the claustrophobia. But I guess if I'm in the German military, you don't have a lot of good options. You can go to the the Eastern Front. uh, You could go in the U-boat service. The Luftwaffe was losing traction as the war went on. I did come away with quite a sense of understanding of what these men went through. You know, in the beginning, when they would return home, the U-boat men... There would be celebrations in Lorient, France. This is occupied France where they had their U-boat pens. But after each trip, the Allies were gaining the upper hand and those celebrations waned. And they had to know when they go right back out on the next patrol after two weeks of rest that the odds are getting worse and worse that they're ever going to return. In an Eric Ferdinand's case, very unusual that we know exactly what happened when his U-boat was eventually hit by bombs and how he died. Normally, the U-boat disappears without a trace. They get bombed, there's an oil slick, and nobody knows what happens. But in So Close to Home, Vertiman and five others are either in the conning tower or on the deck when it gets bombed by an American plane. And they actually escape the U-boat as it's going down. And Vertiman's being held up by two of his men because he's injured. And they're all struggling to keep their heads above the waves. And he tells the men, he says, let me go, let me go. And they do to keep themselves afloat. They let him go and he's never seen again. And that information was in a British interrogation report of the five survivors that were picked up from the U-boat. So they... They explain what was going on on the U-boat and how they kind of all knew their time was up. But I wondered, why did they keep going back, you know? Yeah, well, again, that sense of duty, I guess. So Right. Bad cause, but the obviously no, nobody wants us to fight a war against each other. But now you're glad that they're on our side, that we have such men leading U-boats and leading the defense forces because they really were dedicated. They weren't going to let anything get in the way of their mission. We were talking about U-boats and going on them. And earlier you mentioned cracking the Enigma code at Bletchley Park. Listeners know that I'm friends with the folks there at Bletchley, which is in Milton Keynes over in the UK. You can go there. There's the Bletchley Park podcast where they interview many of these code breakers, people of the generation of Sunny Downs, young women at the time, Wrens, who helped to break the codes, helped Alan Turing and others. But for our purposes, they also have a U-boat model there. It was the U-boat used in the film Enigma of 2001. So if you happen to be in north of London area, you can go and maybe not get in that U-boat. It's only a model, but it's a big model. So it's pretty cool to be able to go and see it. I'd love to do that. I didn't know that. That uh, There's my next trip. Yeah, if you're there, you definitely let me know because I am happy to send anybody over to Bletchley Park. They're really a great bunch of people and they do great work. Speaking to these people, that's living history, right? So whether it's on U-507 or whether it's a Sunny Down story, these are all part of history. Exactly. One more thing about the U-boats, though, the Laconia incident. Tell us about that and how that plays a part in Nuremberg after the war. Well, Verdeman, again, the commander of U-506 that sank the Downs family, on a different patrol, he gets a radio message to immediately change course and proceed to this area where another U-boat commander has hit a ship with the torpedoes. And the name of the ship was the Laconia, and it was a 
British ship, but on board were Italian prisoners of war. This was a big ship. There were over a thousand people on it. So, you know, the U-boat commander realizes, oh, God, you know, we're just hit the ship with our own Axis allies, the Italians on it. We're going to not only rescue them, we're just going to rescue everybody. And so Vertiman is called in to assist. And to read the war diary, you almost get a feeling that they enjoyed this part of rescuing these people and they enjoyed helping the children and feeding them and getting as many as they could on the U-boat or on the U-boat decks. Others, they would put in line behind the U-boats and dinghies and string it behind them. Surprisingly, I don't know if communications got mixed up or exactly what the reason was, but a a U.S. warplane ends up bombing the U-boats when they have these survivors on board. And everybody has to get off and they have to crash dive except for the people inside the U-boat, and they could be Italian POWs or they could have been British. They're a mix of both. And then they come back up and they proceed trying to rescue people. It's just an amazing turn of events to see this. And in the Nuremberg trials, you know, when Donitz is being tried, this is something that was brought up, this act of humanity, and also brought up that never once did he order his men to strafe people in the water or kill survivors, even though he was pressured by Hitler. Donitz had his own code of honor as as well. He and Hitler were at odds over the use of U-boats. Hitler always thought there'd be an invasion through Norway, and he always had a few U-boats up in the North Sea in case that would happen. And Donitz was pleading at the Americans early before we're prepared that these two that have gone into the Gulf have had such success and more. But he never could convince Hitler of that. Well, that's fortunate for us. You think how those two U-boats could have made a big difference when you consider how much U-506 and U-507 had success there targeting shipping. It's scary. They could have shut off the Mississippi. Imagine what that would have done. There's so many things that could have happened here early in the war. Right. For our part, we are inside of land now, so to speak. So let me ask you one final question that we'll explore together, and that is, where is the Heredia, and when did we last hear from her wreck, so to speak? (laughs) The uh, Heredia is at the bottom of the sea, about 40 miles off New Orleans in the mouth of the Mississippi, but it's not necessarily very deep water. And recently, I want to say this off the top of my head, maybe 20 years ago, it was discovered and divers went down and it was in the bot and it was identified as the Heredia. You know, Sonny Downs has kept this story of his survival with him all these years. He learned early on that if he told people about it, they wouldn't believe him. Hmm. So he eventually got a copy of the front page of the New Orleans Times Picayune from May of 1942. And on the front page is a picture of him, his sister, his mother, and the father, and the story of their survival. And he would have to to show people that because nobody believed him. (laughs) They would laugh. They would go, there weren't U-boats in the Gulf of Mexico. You know, tell me another good one. (laughs) So he he had kind of quieted down about it until he opened up to myself and the co-author. And then through family members, we found a tape recording made by his mother, for example, and a couple interviews that his father had granted. So that's how we were able to paint the picture of each of the four people's survival story, because only Sonny and his father were together. The mother and the daughter were alone in the ocean and in one case relied on the heroism of another person, but the mother was alone the entire time. And when they find the wreck in 92, by the way, nobody goes and tries to find the survivors or anything, which seems amazing. It's almost as if, not that they don't believe it, I guess, but it's almost as if it doesn't occur to them. There's no journalist who says, let's find out if there's anybody alive who was on that. It's almost as if it was just sank and nobody was on it. But it is really a grave for half of the people that were on board at the time. Exactly. And that's why Sunny Downs was this, I keep using the word gem, this, you know, living history to be so sharp and articulate, to be bringing back what was happening right off our shores. Well, Michael Togus, author of So Close to Home, 
Thank you for coming on the show today to share the story of the survivors and the U-boat men who sent their ship to the bottom. They are all really worthy of being known. I enjoyed the book very much, especially because as somebody who's read a ton of World War II stuff and seen all the movies and everything, this was a theater of the war and a story that I had never heard before, never even thought about. So thank you and best of luck with the book. Uh, thank you so much, Dean. It was a lot of fun trading stories about the So Close to Home story. Well, the honor was mine. I enjoyed it. And give Sunny Downs my best, please. I will. Again, the book is So Close to Home, a true story of an American family's fight for survival during World War II. As always... You can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there. Or even bookmark the URL off the banner ad on our homepage for all your online purchases through Amazon. Amazon Amazon.com gives us a small percentage of every purchase you make at no additional cost to you. Once again, thanks to Michael Togus for joining us and for sharing the tale of the Downs family's experience as civilians caught up in the U-boat war, and for sharing the story of the U-boat commanders themselves, the men stuck in those steel tubes down there, trying to balance duty with the horrors of war. You can find our guest at michaeltogus.com or at michaeltogus on Twitter. Again, that last name is T-O-U-G-I-A-S. And don't forget to let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or at facebook.com slash history author. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for Classical Wisdom Wednesday, History in Five Friday, and then right back here for next Monday's all-new interview. And remember, if you do subscribe to us on iTunes, please take a minute to leave us a review. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks for time traveling with us today. And happy reading. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. 